All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Michael Awad, and welcome to the uh, third annual SAGES Resident Webinar. We are uh, conducting an absite review. Uh, first of all, let me say thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. I know um, everybody is very busy, so uh, thanks for making the time. And also, before I forget, let me wish you good luck on the uh, absite in January or for whatever uh, exam you're studying for. I'm going to be kicking off with a review of the esophagus, stomach, and uh, obesity. Dr. Blatnick will be uh, going over general abdomen, hernia, and spleen. Dr. Traugott will be reviewing colorectal and anal disease. And finally, we'll have uh, small intestine, biliary disease, and flexible endoscopy by Dr. Uh, Al Sadi. These are really the uh, uh, bulk of the topics you'll see on the app site, but obviously um, being uh, SAGES as our uh, sponsoring society, we're not going to have uh, some of the other topics like vascular, breast, or uh, endocrine, but um, uh, obviously those will be included on the app site, so don't forget those as well. Um, I want to just also briefly mention about uh, SAGES itself. SAGES is the... Um, Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, which is sponsoring the webinar. If you haven't heard of it already, SAGES is the main uh, society for laparoscopic and endoscopic surgery, and it is a wonderful, tremendous uh, organization. SAGES has really uh, helped to sponsor and start many careers. Um, I joined it when I was a uh, resident and uh, 20 years later still have been an active member of SAGES. Um, if you uh, haven't been to a SAGES meeting, it is also one of the most vibrant, um, uh, exciting meetings you can go to. The next meeting is actually a World Congress, which is uh, a joint meeting with CAGS, which is the Canadian Association of General Surgeons, in April in uh, Dr. El Sadie's hometown of Seattle, Washington. So it's going to be a great meeting. I hope you all can uh, consider joining SAGES and attending the SAGES meeting in April. I also want to uh, give a uh, shout-out to our th sponsors, Thumbroll. And Thumbroll is an uh, amazing app. If you haven't downloaded it already, I would strongly encourage our uh, respondents uh, to do so. And in fact, you can go ahead and um, check it out while we're um, getting our webinar underway. You'll find it both on the Apple and uh, Android uh, app stores. It is... Um, uh, I'll, let me go ahead and show you right now the the app uh, screenshot itself. It's a list of uh, almost 100 procedures and, and so forth in the app. And here it shows you step by step. You have this kind of handy scroll bar with you can use with your thumb. And go through the steps at your own rate. You can scroll forward. You can scroll back. And each caption is uh, completely annotated. You can go at your own pace and... Um, you can also zoom in on any of the photographs to see further detail. Repair of a cardiac injury is shown uh, in this one. But like I said, there's almost 100 procedures and more being published uh, every week. Thumbroll, again, is available on the uh, Apple and Android uh, app stores. So again, if you haven't already, please go ahead and download the app. You'll find it extremely useful and, frankly, should be an essential uh, component in any surgical trainee's uh, toolbox. All right, um, let's go ahead and uh, dive in. So uh, just a quick uh, discussion about the format for tonight's program. Uh, this is um, a kind of a high-yield, high-volume question and answer session. Uh, the questions come from the SCORE portal. Many of you have access to the portal, but just uh, uh, much credit to uh, SCORE for deriving a, a lot of these uh, questions. All right, let's go ahead and dive in again. My name is Michael Awad. I'm a minimally invasive surgeon at uh, Washington University in uh, St. Louis and active SAGES member, as I said, as the former program director for the general surgery residency here and uh, very used to counseling residents about the app site and um, the American Board of Surgeries. All right, we should be ready to go here. And so the first question is, it's a 37-year-old man with a three-year history of ulcers. Uh, admitted to the hospital with recurrent epigastric pain and heme-positive stools. One year ago, he underwent closure for perforated duodenal ulcer. Um, and I'm just going to uh, allow the timer to uh, to go a little bit longer here. Um, he underwent closure for perforated duodenal ulcer. A plasma and gastrin determination, 400 picograms obtained. The single best test to establish the diagnosis of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is. 
uh, A, a calcium stimulation test, B, a meat stimulation test, C, transhepatic sampling of the splenic vein for gastric levels, D, a secretin simulation test, or E, overnight measurement of gastric acid and volume secretion. So I'll give folks just another couple of seconds to uh, answer. Okay, and I think uh, everybody can see the uh, correct answer there is uh, D. Uh, so just to review, Zollinger-Ellison is a syndrome, you know, describing a gastronoma. Um, really, symptoms are due to increased levels of circulating gastrin, and when fastrin, uh, fasting serum gastrin levels are measured, if it's greater than 1,000 picograms per milliliter in the setting of hypersetidy and ulcer disease, it's really pathognomonic for gastronoma. Um, there are many conditions that can also cause hypergastrinemia, and, and to diagnose gastronoma, the secretin stimulation test is performed. Uh, just to review, the way the test is done is a baseline gastrin level is drawn. Two units per kilo of secretin is administered IV, and then you draw gastrin levels at five-minute intervals for half an hour. If you have an increase in gastrin over uh, more than 200 picograms um, above the basal level, that supports diagnosis of, of gastrinoma. Okay. Um, the next question. Uh, a 78-year-old woman presents to the emergency room for evaluation of her peg tube, which she reports has become increasingly more painful since it was placed several months ago. On exam, the patient's peg tube bumper was found to be eroding through the skin of her abdominal wall. Which of the following measures is most likely to reduce the risk of this complication? A, using a push instead of pull technique. B, administering the dose of prophylactic antibiotic prior to peg tube insertion. C, swabbing the oropharynx with antiseptic solution prior to the peg tube insertion. D, using endoscopy to ensure the head of the gastrostomy tube is in loose contact with the gastric mucosa. Or E, using the safe track technique during peg tube placement. And I'm going to start the 20-second uh, timer here. Yeah, the timer's not quite activating, but um, that's okay. We'll count it down. Okay, there we go. All right, let's see a few more responses coming in. All right, so uh, yes, the correct answer is D, using the endoscopy to ensure that the head of the gastrostomy tube is in loose contact with the gastric mucosa. Um, the key thing here is just always when doing a PEG, uh, check the placement of the PEG endoscopically to make sure the bumper is not too tight or, um, or too loose against the stomach mucosa. Um, the bolster of the PEG tube should be just a couple millimeters from the skin and may need to be even loosened on post-op day one because of swelling of the, the intervening tissue. All right, the next question. Uh, Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori infection is A, adequately treated with metronidazole alone, B, recurs in less than 5% of patients at five years in whom the organism was eradicated, C, should be treated with antibiotics in all ulcer patients for at least six weeks. Uh, D, causes peptic ulcer in about 80% of those infected. Or E, is reliably ruled out by a negative urease test from a biopsy specimen obtained endoscopically.
Okay, just a couple seconds left. Okay, and the um, correct answer, uh, uh, let's see, it's not uh, shown on there, but the correct answer is, uh, there we go, is B, recurs in less than 5% of patients at five years in whom the organism was uh, eradicated. Uh, so just a couple things. I see there's a lot of variety on this one, so let's talk about that alone. I think folks uh, fortunately did not select A. Most people know that um, triple or quadruple therapy is required uh, for eradicating H. pylori, so that's good. Um, and it's important to recognize that while um, most of gastric and duodenal ulcers is associated with H. pylori, the opposite is not necessarily true, which is most of people with H. pylori do not have peptic ulcers. So that's why uh, letter D is, is uh, incorrect. Um, when you do biopsy uh, endoscopically, it can um, be used to establish the presence of H. pylori, either histologically or with urease testing. Um, however, keep in mind urease testing is false negative about 10% of the time. Uh, false positive results are rare, however, and so um, uh, and uh, urease testing is much less expensive than histologic confirmation. So oftentimes urease testing is used, and when it's positive, that's all you need to do. You don't need to do histology. Um, the you know treatment of uh, H. pylori most of the time is about 90% of folks are are treated within one week. So answer uh, C is uh, incorrect. Most people can just uh, be treated with one week. Um, and uh, once you get uh, a cure, reinfection rates are very rare, less than one patient per 200 years. So uh, that is a couple of important things about H. pylori. That is a common abscite question, and so important to review that. All right, and the next question. The hepatic vagal branch originates from A, the celiac plexus, B, the celiac vagal branch, C, the posterior gastric nerve of ladder jet, uh, D, the posterior vagal trunk, or E, the anterior vagal trunk. <clears throat> okay, the timer has begun. Okay, and so um, uh, that is correct. The answer is anterior vagal uh, trunk. Um, just a quick uh, diagram that goes along with this. Uh, just uh, to review, um, the anterior vagal trunk is also referred to as the left vagus nerve. It's really kind of the um, uh, orientation of the stomach because it rotates during embryological development. Um, the other term is the right vagus nerve, which is also known as the posterior vagus nerve. As can be seen in the diagram, the hepatic branch of the anterior or left vagus nerve uh, is where that is given rise. Uh, all right, our next question. Chronic enteric blood loss from an area within a hiatal hernia is named A, Dulafoy lesion, B, Cameron's lesion, C, Mallory Weiss tear, D, Cushing's ulcer, or E, gastric varices. Okay, good. So most people got the uh, correct answer, which is the uh, Cameron's lesion. Um, 
and uh, just keeping in mind that uh, sometimes parasophageal hernias, that's all that uh, patients present with is chronic anemia from these uh, Cameron's ulcers. So uh, keep that in mind when evaluating patients with parasophageal hernias. Let's go on to the next one. 60, excuse me, a 40-year-old woman with a long-standing history of heartburn on 20 milligrams of uh, proton pump inhibitor undergoes endoscopy. The uh, biopsy of the distal esophagus shows intestinal metaplasia with low-grade dysplasia. The best course of action for this patient is A, continue current treatment and repeat endoscopy in three years. B, recommend esophagectomy for dysplastic changes in high-risk adenocarcinoma. C, repeat, endoscopic, uh, repeat endo endoscopy with biopsy every six months for surveillance. D, initiate H. pylori treatment to limit progression of dysplasia. Or E, perform a Nissen fundoplication and eliminate need for further surveillance. OK, very good. So the uh, correct answer is uh, C, repeat endoscopy with biopsy. Uh, uh, every six months for surveillance. So let's talk a minute about uh, Barrett's and uh, dysplasia uh, in this setting. And this is a very important one, as uh, this often comes up on the uh, app site as well. So um, uh, you know, keeping in mind, uh, once Barrett's is discovered, that's uh, right there, an indication for repeat uh, surveillance. The frequency of the surveillance is um, determined by uh, any further pathology. And so for Barrett's, it can be monitored with, um, depending on the, on the recommendation, every one to three years. However, in this case, we have low-grade dysplasia, which warrants a more frequent um, uh, biopsy protocol in which the, the uh, distal esophagus is uh, biopsied thoroughly in uh, four quadrants in several uh, regions every six months. Um, typically, again, as long as it stays as low-grade dysplasia, it can continue to be monitored. Uh, PPI therapy is usually um, indicated. Um, it, esophagectomy is not usually indicated for low-grade dysplasia um, because the malignancy risk is about 6 to 10% uh, per year. Um, another very important point that's often uh, uh, confused on an site or in other places is a Nissen fund application is, is good for treating GERD. However, there's no evidence that a Nissen will revert, uh, reverse uh, Barrett's, uh, uh, dis, uh, Barrett's esophagus. And so that should not be a substitute for uh, uh, treatment of uh, Barrett's with uh, surveillance. All right, next uh, question. The most common cause of gastric outlet obstruction in adults is A, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, B, adenocarcinoma of the stomach, C, duodenal stenosis secondary to peptic ulcer, uh, uh, ulceration, D, gastric lymphoma, or E, bezoar. All right. Um, so this one uh, also mentions or is, uh, uh, is warranted. The correct answer, uh, the check mark uh, coming up here, is actually B, adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Uh, for those that answered C, it would have been right about 20 years ago. Uh, however, the, the advent of uh, H2 blockers and uh, PPIs uh, duodenal stenosis um, secondary to peptic ulcers is only responsible for up 20% now of cases of um, uh, gastric outlet obstruction in adults. Um, so that's a very, very important point, and you need to be on the lookout for um, uh, uh, gastric cancer. Um, that's the most common tumor type. Also, pancreatic carcinoma, lymphoma, and gallbladder cancer can cause gastric outlet obstruction. Bezoar is pretty uncommon. Uh, 
And keep in mind, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is a condition of infancy, uh, which is treated with a pyloromyotomy. All right, next question. Which of the following statements concerning gastric adenocarcinoma is true? A, susceptibility is primarily genetic rather than environmental. B, incidence peaks at age 40. Uh, C, it presents as an early lesion with no invasion of the muscularis propria in approximately 25 per patients in the West. D, gastric adenomatous polyps, as well as H. pylori infection are risk factors for subsequent development of adenocarcinoma. Or E, it occurs more commonly in women than in men. All right, that is correct. The answer is D, gastric adenomatous polyps, uh, as well as H. pylori at risk factors for subsequent development of uh, adenocarcinoma. Um, it, it does tend to be more common um, in males than in females, so E is uh, incorrect. Um, ingested uh, salt and other chemically preserved foods, as well as H. pylori infection or other uh, risk factors. And so it's generally more environmental rather than genetic, and that's why uh, A is wrong. Um, the, the peak incidence of presentation is generally in the 60s or 70s and not, uh, not at age 40. Um, and uh, uh, generally in Western uh, countries, the diagnosis is usually made after the disease is fairly uh, progressed to locally advanced or, or metastatic uh, lesions. All right, uh, next question. Which statement regarding the classification and treatment of gastric ulcers is true? A, type 1 ulcers are associated with acid secretion and are located at the GE junction. B, type 5 ulcers are diffuse and related to the use of medications such as NSAIDs. C, biopsies for bleeding gastric ulcers are best done at the time of initial intervention. D, type 2 and 3 ulcers are not associated with acid hypersecretion. Or E, type 4 ulcers always require a Billroth 1 or 2 reconstruction and a truncal vagotomy. And again, which of these is true? Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, so the correct answer is indeed B. Type 5 ulcers are diffuse and related to the use of medications such as NSAIDs. And just a quick uh, slide to help kind of uh, review these. So keeping in mind, type 1 uh, uh, ulcers, as shown in the uh, first slide, are in the antrum near the lesser curvature, and these are associated with normal acid levels. Uh, type 2, are com which is shown in the top right image, about 25%, are combined gastric and duodenal ulcers. These have a high acid level, such as type 3. The difference between 2 and 3 is the location, which are typically prepyloric. And type 4 ulcers are in the proximal stomach and cardia associated with normal acid levels. And again, in this case, the type 5 ulcers are diffuse and related to medications such as uh, NSAIDs. And this is important because it will determine the response for uh, uh, therapy. All right, next question. A 28-year-old woman presents with a four-year history of progressive dysphagia, substernal chest pain, and regurgitation. Uh, 
the exam reveals thickened fingers with calcified nodules at the joints, telangiectasias. Um, review systems is positive for Raynaud's phenomenon. And monometry shows aperistalsis, lower esophageal relaxant pressure of 4, resting pressure of 8 millimeters of mercury. Endoscopy shows severe erosive esophagitis. Which of the following is least helpful in this patient? Again, the, the question asks, which is least helpful? Okay. All right. Sorry, the timer is uh, glitching a little bit there, but we have about 10 seconds left to answer. Okay, good. All right, so this one has a range of uh, responses, so let's take a minute to uh, talk about this one. The correct answer is E, Heller myotomy. So the key in this one is that the um, uh, patient has uh, sclerodermatous esophagus. Um, and what distinguishes this one from achalasia? So achalasia, uh, the answer E would have been correct. Heller myotomy would be helpful. Achalasia has esophageal body aperistalsis. Uh, however, uh, this uh, patient has a, um, a low resting pressure of 8 millimeters of mercury, whereas in a, a, a chalasia they have a non-relaxing or a high uh, resting uh, uh, pressure and a, a high uh, relaxation pressure. Uh, so this patient is unlikely to benefit from a Heller myotomy, unlike an achalasia patient. Um, these are very difficult to treat all over, but sometimes promotility agents are used, anti-reflux medications uh, can be used, and even a partial fundoplication can be used to help with some of the reflux uh, symptoms. In severe cases, an esophagectomy can be performed. All right, uh, number 11. During workup for dysphagia, an otherwise healthy 50-year-old man Esophagoscopy and biopsy reveals adenocarcinoma of the distal esophagus. Uh, CT scan of the chest and abdomen shows thickening of the distal esophagus and no other abnormalities. Which of the following tests is essential in determining whether neoadjuvant therapy uh, should be recommended? All right, very good. Endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, what we're worried about uh, here, obviously, is... Um, uh, esophageal cancer, and uh, really one of the, the only tests that accurately determines the depth of tumor penetration is endoscopic ultrasonography. And the most accurate test for identifying whether there's local lymph node metastases, which will determine whether new adjuvant therapy should be recommended. All right, let's move on. The next is uh, a 67-year-old man who underwent endoscopy for anemia, weight loss, fatigue, and epigastric pain. The endoscopy showed submucosal gastric mass, which was biopsied. The cell of origin and histochemical staining finding most consistent with a GIST, or gastrointestinal stromal tumor, are interstitial cells of Cahal and CD34, enterochromaffin cell and CD117, and then you can see the other combinations there. I won't read them off to you. All right, and uh, okay, good. The correct answer is indeed uh, D, interstitial cells of Cajal and CD117. Uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors arise from the interstitial cells of Cajal, and the really histochemical um, 
uh, finding is CKIT, proto-oncogene, which is CD117. Uh, CD34 is positive in a number of these, but CD117 or CKIT are really the, uh, the hallmark of just tumors. Um, just so you know, gastric carcinoids are what uh, arise from enterochromaffin cells. All right, I think we are, um, uh, we just had a few of those four gut questions, and I think we're ready to switch over to the uh, general abdomen, hernia, and spleen questions. While we're waiting, I'm going to introduce our um, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Blatnick. Uh, Dr. Blatnick, uh, good friend and colleague of mine, who is uh, here at Washington University in St. Louis as well, really one of the um, leading uh, international experts in uh, uh, hernia and uh, abdominal wall reconstructions. Uh, Dr. Blatnick, uh, welcome and thank you very much for participating in the uh, webinar. Thanks again for having me. Um, you know, this is a great pleasure to be here. It's actually my third year participating. I wish uh, we had something like this when I was back taking the app site, um, as, as I think this is incredibly helpful, and, and hopefully everybody who's on board will, will get a lot out of it. So we've got uh, about 20 questions we're going to try and get through. We'll spend some time going over the ones that have some uh, uh, varied answers, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on those. So let's jump right into it. First question is, uh, with the dissection of an indirect hernia sac during an open inguinal hernia orophy, an unusual rapid oozing began, which filled the inguinal canal with bright red blood. The bleeding's coming from the undersurface of the abdominal wall. Which artery is most likely injured? I think the key things as you're reading this question is to think of what, you know, the words that they give you are artery, and that is coming from the undersurface of the abdominal wall. Good. So 93% of you got this right. It's the inferior epigastric. That's what you want to worry for, worry about in a situation like this. Cremasteric testicular vessels uh, can give you some oozing, but certainly not to the extent that they're describing here. Your iliac, your internal iliac, obviously is diving down deep. That'd be hard to hit. Um, your femoral uh, vessels can be somewhat in the area if you're doing uh, like a transition stitch. But again, that uh, would be uh, least likely, especially in the way they describe it in this question. All right, let's move on to the next. The incident of inguinal hernia recurrence after repair is around 5%. Which of the following is associated with an increased recurrence rate? Uh, female gender, smoking repair during pregnancy, mesh placed in the preperitoneal space, or chronic anticoagulation use. Good. So I, I tell patients when I talk to them in the office, there are very few things that people agree upon in medicine. Of those things that increase your risk for any hernia to come back is smoking and, in general, obesity. Um, so in this question, uh, smoking is the most likely answer, whether, it, again, it's an inguinal hernia or a ventral hernia. I think that's a pretty clear answer. So uh, question number three, after undergoing splenectomy for ITP, a patient has persistent disease concerning for a missed accessory spleen, and a technetium scan is ordered to localize it. Which is the most common location for an accessory spleen? This is just a fact question. you got to just know the answer to, but certainly something that frequently comes up uh, on the app site. Good. So the up to 15 to 30 percent of patients with ITP may present with accessory spleens, uh, and if you fail to take them out at the time of your initial splenectomy, they may have recurrent symptoms similar to what's presented here uh, in this question. The most common locations where you'll see it are either the hilar region, uh, which is a little over half of the time, 54 percent, then followed by the splenic vascular pedicle and the greater omentum are the other two big areas where you may find it. But by far, the hilar region is the most likely place where you'll find accessory spleen. So question number four, of all the following, uh, all of the following, I'm sorry, are reasons to repair incisional hernias upon diagnosis except risk of bowel incarceration and strangulation, a hernia that interferes with activities of daily living, an asymptomatic hernia associated with loss of abdominal domain, an asymptomatic hernia in a patient who needs abdominal surgery for another reason, or thinning and ulceration of the skin overlying the hernia. And 
and as somebody who sees lots of hernia patients, you will see every single one of these in one form or another, but it comes down to figuring out what is the best thing for each patient and who ultimately needs and would benefit from surgery. So good, so an asymptomatic hernia, I think those are the big things to take away. Patients who are asymptomatic, obviously that puts it into a different level. So an asymptomatic hernia with a loss of abdominal main does not necessarily uh, require surgery. Um, and the other asymptomatic hernia patient in this question would be somebody who's getting abdominal surgery for another reason. And we see that quite frequently and do those cases in combinations with either colorectal or gynecology or urology who they're going in for some other reason and they have an incisional hernia at that time that will help repair them at the end. The other answers I think are pretty clear cut. Bowel incarceration, strangulation, interference of daily living, thinning ulceration of the skin are all pretty clear reasons that patients would benefit from a hernia repair. So number five, a 65-year-old 100-kilogram patient is in the intensive care unit intubated after being admitted with sepsis. He has received a large volume of intravenous fluid resuscitation and his intra-abdominal pressure as measured via the bladder is 18 millimeters of mercury. He has normal urine output and peak airway pressures. Of the following, which describes the most appropriate management of this patient? A, continued current management is 18 millimeters of mercury is a normal intra-abdominal pressure. B, reduce fluid administration and minimize enteral feedings. C, paralyze the patient. D, insertion of an intra-abdominal drain, or D, E, decompressive laparotomy as 18 millimeters of mercury is indicative of grade three uh, intra-abdominal hypertension. So uh, that is correct, so reduce fluid administration and minimize enteral feeding. So a couple key things to, to take away from here. So a normal abdominal pressure in a patient is usually in the area of five to seven millimeters of mercury. One of the keys in this stem is they describe the patient as being 100 kilograms, which would make them obese patients. So it's not abnormal to see pressures in the area of nine to 15 millimeters of mercury at baseline in those patients. So uh, if you look at abdominal hypertension in general, there's usually four grades. Grade one is 12 to 15, grade two is 16 to 20, grade three is 21 to 25, and grade four is greater than 25. In general, for grade one and two, you can usually manage them medically. Again, in this patient in the STEM, they tell you normal urine output and normal airway pressures, uh, so they're not having uh, any uh, physiologic decompensation related to them. So for these patients, reduce fluid administration and minimize enteral feedings. And those that have worsening symptoms or other systemic signs of intra-abdominal hypertension. Those are the ones where you consider to, to paralyzing the patient um, or different things like that, uh, such as the surgical decompressive laparotomy. So pressure, yes, is high, not abnormal, just mildly elevated in an obese patient. And normal uh, systemic function as far as urine output and airway pressures means just medical management for this patient. Go to the next question. An indirect inguinal hernia is repaired laparoscopically by stapling, stapling polypropylene mesh over the defect. The complication of this repair most frequently associated with significant postoperative pain is A, the formation of a hydrocele in the sac, B, recurrence of the hernia, C, erosion of the mesh into the intestines, D, entrapment of the ilioinguinal nerve, or E, entrapment of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So lots of different answers here. So I think the takeaway is post-operative pain, laparoscopic hernia repair, staples slash tacks were placed uh, as far as that. So in laparoscopic repair, the nerve that's most likely to be injured is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And where that happens is if you put tacks in your mesh and the lateral portion without ensuring you can palpate the tip of the tack or puts you at risk of injuring the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. The ilioinguinal nerve is much more commonly injured in open repair all the other things you certainly can see in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, whether that's a hydrocele, recurrence of the hernia, or erosion of the mesh into the intestines. But in this patient with significant postoperative pain, the thing we worry about is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So number seven, all the following are true regarding spagalian hernias except uh, A, they commonly occur above the arcuate line. B, a significant percentage of patients will develop bowel incarceration or strangulation and therefore uh, should be repaired. C, 
see the spagalian fascia is the area between the semilunar line and the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, where D patients may present with a bulge lateral to the rectus or may not be clinically apparent. This is an accept question. So that is correct. So again, accept questions. You just got to make sure you take your time and read uh, about what's going on. So spagalian hernias usually uh, occur right at the junction of the arcuate line and the posterior rectus sheath. Um, as far as the other answers here, uh, it's not uncommon for patients to be uh, present without a clear uh, hernia defect or bulge when you when they they come in, and it's because the hernia is not necessarily through all the layers of the abdominal wall. Um, it's right at the junction where there's no posterior rectus sheath. So below the arcuate line, there's no posterior rectus sheath, and above it, there is a posterior rectus sheath. Um, so that's the key thing to take away. So they're not uh, above the arcuate line. They're usually below. Uh, it's not uncommon for patients to have bowel incarceration or strangulation, and so most people would recommend repairing it. Uh, we talked about the layers of where things are and how they may present. Question uh, number eight is a 58-year-old chronic alcoholic that has an umbilical hernia and ascites of recent onset. He has never been treated with diuretics or salt restriction. On examination, he has massive ascites with a large umbilical hernia with thin skin at the apex. There is a slow ooze of clear odorless fluid from the hernia. Therapy now should be A, hernia repair with placement of a peritonovenous shunt, B, umbilical hernia repair with prosthetic mesh, C, bed rest, intravenous antibiotics, aggressive medical diuresis, and hernia repair during this admission. D, paracentesis and discharge with treatment of antibiotics and abdominal binder. Or E, trial of strict diuretic regimen and salt restriction at home. I think the poll is back on the right thing for those who are watching. Good, so C is the correct answer. I think the key takeaway here is the, the ooze of clear fluid, so the fact that he's leaking ascites through his hernia. That's an urgent problem that really requires aggressive management and should be taken care of during this admin, uh, hospital admission as opposed to being sent home. Um, doesn't necessarily need emergent therapy, uh, running to the operating room right away, but they should get uh, antibiotics, bed rest, have their diuresis managed medically, and they can get hernia repair at this point in time. Um, most people would probably not use a prosthetic mesh at this setting, given the risk for uh, infection. Um, discharging home, whether that be with an abdominal binder or diuretic therapy, is not correct since he is draining uh, fluid from his uh, wound. And it doesn't necessarily need a shunt because he's never tried medical therapy before, so that would be the first line therapy. All right, we'll move on to question number nine. A 25-year-old, 220-kilogram female presents to the emergency department with three hours of acute onset right lower quadrant pain. She describes the pain as mild and reports persistent nausea and vomiting. There's moderate diffuse tenderness on exam. Laboratory studies reveal a white blood cell count of 17,000 and a negative urine HCG. She's too heavy to fit on your CT scan table. Which of the following diagnostic tests would be most helpful in finding the cause of the patient's abdominal pain? A, abdominal plane film. B, abdominal ultrasound. C, uh, diagnostic peritoneal lavage. D, diagnostic laparoscopy. Or E, none of the above. So while that's booting up, we'll just kind of go through the different answers. So I think the takeaways here is the fact that the patient is 220 kilograms and there's not going to fit on the CT scan table. Um, that really limits all of your radiologic diagnostic uh, value, so plain film and ultrasound are going to be of limited use in this setting. Uh, diagnostic peritoneal lavage potentially, but again, that's something in a patient that this obese is going to be incredibly difficult to do. Um, and with the setting of a negative HCG and a white blood cell count of 17,000 and uh, moderate diffuse tenderness, uh, I think a diagnostic laparoscopy would be the right answer.
uh, in this setting. Which of the following is the correct set of vaccines to administer to a patient who is asplenic? Again, something you just need to know. Pneumococcal, herpes zoster, meningococcal influenza, pneumococcal hep B, meningococcal haemophilus influenza, pneumococcal H flu, meningococcal and influenza, pertussis, H flu, meningococcal and influenza, pneumococcal influenza, MMR, and herpes zoster. Great, 96 percent, that's correct. You know, the one thing here is you kind of read through those, I think everybody's remembered pneumococcal, H flu, meningococcal uh, as being the encapsulated organisms that you worry about. Asplenic patients, though, are also at risk for secondary infections after influenza. I think in this day and age, almost everybody gets their flu shots, but certainly something now that's recommended for asplenic patients, not only to get their coverage for the encapsulated organisms, but also for influenza. Keep going. Which of the following individuals is at least risk for post-splenectomy sepsis, so sticking in the, the spleen group? Number A, a six-year-old who underwent elective splenectomy for hereditary spherocytosis. B, a 40-year-old who underwent elective splenectomy for lymphoma. C, a 13-year-old who underwent emergent splenectomy for blunt trauma. D, a 35-year-old who underwent emergent splenectomy for blunt trauma. Or E, a 22-year-old who underwent elective splenectomy for thalassemia. So this is at least risk for post-splenectomy sepsis. Good, so D is the correct answer. So the takeaway from this is adults who've had splenectomy after trauma have the lowest risk of post-splenectomy sepsis than all those other people that were listed with splenic disease. In particular, patients who've had lymphoma or thalassemias are probably at the highest risk for post-splenectomy sepsis, as are children. All right, next question. Which of the following statements about umbilical hernia repair is true? A, they are more common in men. B, incarceration is more common in women. C, uh, spontaneous closure after delivery can occur with pregnancy associated with umbilical hernia. D, elective repair is indicated in patients with ascites to prevent rupture of the skin. Or E, pediatric umbilical hernia should not be repaired until the child is 12 years old. Again, which one of the following is true? So that's correct. C is the answer that they're looking for here. Uh, spontaneous closure after delivery can occur with pregnancy associated umbilical hernia. I think in regards to the other questions, so umbilical hernias are actually more common in uh, females than in men, three to one time, so that, that takes out letter A. Uh, incarceration isn't necessarily, is actually more commonly seen in men than in women, so the other way around. Uh, as far as spontaneous closure after pregnancy, that certainly can happen. The, the other one that a lot of people answered was the question related to ascites. So just because somebody has ascites doesn't mean they necessarily need their hernia repair. The other question that we saw earlier was somebody who was leaking acidic fluid and obviously needed more urgent repair. But I think in patients, just because they have ascites, they don't necessarily need to get their hernia repair. Uh, they should be managed medically for treatment of their ascites uh, and then can be addressed at that time if needed. Question 13, which of the following statements regarding preoperative splenic artery embolization is correct? A, the goal of preoperative splenic artery embolization is to facilitate easier identification of the splenic artery intraoperatively. D, the pancreatica magna should, or must be embolized, I'm sorry, to ensure complete splenic artery embolization. C, successful splenic artery embolization results in about 80% of the splenic parenchyma becoming ischemic. D, microspheres or gelatin powder are used to embolize the splenic artery. Or E, splenic artery embolization is most useful before open splenectomy and adds little benefit to laparoscopic splenectomy. Oh, 
more seconds. So that's good. Uh, C is the correct answer. So you get about 80% of splenic parenchyma becoming ischemic. Uh, it can be used whether you're doing laparoscopic or uh, open uh, splenectomy to reduce blood loss. In general, they would recommend using small coils or absorbable gelatin sponge to embolize the individual branches of the splenic artery with the goal to, uh, being to minimize embolization to other vessels such as the pancreatic and magna, which can result in ischemia to the pancreatic tails. Uh, the microspheres and gelatin powder should be avoided because they're of uh, small size and they can migrate to other organs and cause unintended tissue ischemia. So C is the correct answer. Next question. Uh, which of the following patient characteristics is a contraindication to laparoscopy? A, pregnancy. B, abdominal aortic aneurysm. C, bowel obstruction. D, uncorrectable coagulopathy or E, obesity? So I think the key kind of takeaway here is, you know, there's uh, there's absolute contraindications and there's relative contraindications to laparoscopy. I think as people become more comfortable with the approach and the technique, there's there's fewer and fewer contraindications. And this thing, I think the the few true contraindications would be uncorrectable coagulopathy, and I would also add the inability to tolerate general anesthesia. The other questions, the other com or um, answers that you see here are relative contraindications. Um, that, that may prevent uh, you from doing laparoscopy, but none of them are as clear-cut as the uncorrectable coagulopathy. All right, uh, a few more questions here to finish up. So question 15, testicular atrophy following inguinal hernioplasty is usually due to A, thrombosis of the veins in the spermatic cord, B, subacute orchitis, C, damage to the external spermatic artery, D, ligation of the vas deferens, or E, damage to the testicle from mobilization. I think this question comes up pretty commonly on the app site, uh, and again, something that they just need to know. So that's correct. So uh, usually testicular atrophy is an uncommon, but it's actually a recognized complication of inguinal hernia repair. It's pretty rare, less than 0.1% uh, of initial repairs and about 1% of recurrent repairs. But in general, the primary cause of testicular atrophy is damage to the delicate veins of the pimpiniform plexus, so the spermatic cord, that leads to thrombosis and venous insufficiency of the testicle. Um, so that's the correct answer. Uh, 16, which of the following hematologic disorders is unlikely to respond to splenectomy? Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, B, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, C, thalassemia, D, sideroblastic anemia, or E, hereditary spherocytosis? The key thing to, to take away from this one is, is what is affected by the spleen. And so hematologic disorders that respond to splenectomy are those uh, conditions where the blood cells are destroyed or removed by the spleen. So ITP is the most common hematologic indications for splenectomy and is usually characterized by IgG antibodies against platelets. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia is an autoimmune disorder of antibodies against red blood cells. Uh, symptomatic thalassemia and hereditary spherocytosis may also benefit from splenectomy, but for this question, the sideroblastic anemia does not respond to splenectomy. All right, next question, number 17. A 45-year-old man comes to your clinic for follow-up one month after open inguinal hernia repair with mesh for an incarcerated left inguinal hernia. He endorses pain along the incision. Additionally, the inside of his proximal thigh is numb, uh, burns, or simply hurts when it's touched. When he moves in certain ways, he gets a stabbing pain in that area 
accompanied with a sensation of being stung by a bee. Which nerve is most likely causing this constellation of symptoms? So A, the general branch of the general femoral nerve, B, the ilioinguinal nerve, C, the cremasteric nerve, D, iliohypogastric, or E, obturator nerve. So in contrast to the um, laparoscopic groin pain question we had earlier, this is now open repair. Right, so the correct answer is the ileal inguinal nerve. Uh, that's probably the most common nerve that's injured during open inguinal hernia repair. It can be entrapped by sutures, meshes, or scar tissue. I don't. Do we have a, a picture uh, to go along with this? Uh, is that working? Uh, I don't think that picture's up, Dr. Planick, sir. Okay. So, so no problem. So, so things to take away. I think when you go back, take a look at your textbook. There's some good uh, descriptions that show where are the different nerves in your groin and kind of what areas that they uh, serve. And so, when you see somebody who comes back with groin pain after an inguinal hernia. There's actually some good techniques as far as mapping where their pain is located, and then you can reference back to some of those pictures. But the correct answer here is the ileal inguinal nerve. I right, got three more questions to finish up. So 18, a 79-year-old uh, man with multiple medical comorbidities, including congestive heart failure, aortic stenosis, and COPD, develops appendicitis with an appendiceal abscess. He's been treated non-operatively with antibiotics and a percutaneous drain for the past five days. His elevated white blood cell count pain and fevers have resolved. What do you recommend for future management? A, keeping a percutaneous drain in place for six to eight weeks. B, interval appendectomy in six to eight weeks. C, colonoscopy or barium enema one month after discharge. D, remove drain and no further treatment. Or E, continued antibiotics for six to eight weeks. So the question kind of that Tom kind of writes down, that the takeaways is this a, an older gentleman, 79-year-old, uh, multiple medical comorbidities, who's actually done well uh, with his percutaneous drainage, and so you need to manage him in the future. So the correct answer is actually uh, C, a colonoscopy or barium enema one month after discharge. And the reason for that is 5% um, of patients who present with um, uh, appendicitis at an older age can actually be due to colon cancer. Uh, rather than just uh, benign appendicitis. So the correct answer for this gentleman, if he has not had a colonoscopy, would be to colon get a colonoscopy prior to proceeding with any interval intervention. Uh, so colonoscopy only after GI agrees, as somebody commented, that's incorrect. This is a surgical society uh, that specializes in endoscopy. So you should be able to do your own colonoscopies if need be, uh, as you will have to do to sit for your board. So uh, question number 19, a 15-year-old boy presents to the emergency department with right lower quadrant pain, fevers, and a CT scan demonstrating evidence of perforated appendicitis with a 3-centimeter associated abscess. You relay the following plan to the patient's mother, admit, and place them on IV antibiotics and have interventional radiology place a drain in the associated abscess. The mother would like to know the risks and benefits of delayed operative interventions over just taking out his appendix during this admission. So the answer choices are A, longer hospital stay, B, higher intradominal abscess rate, C, decreased postoperative complications, D, lower recurrence rate of appendicitis, or E, increased incidence of more extensive resection. So that's correct. Uh, so non-operative management of appendicitis has become more and more prevalent, uh, not only for children, but even in some adults nowadays. So I think the key things to take away, especially in somebody like this who has a perforation uh, interventional uh, um, radiology drain placement, would be let them cool down and then come back at a later date. I think to try and go in and do appendectomy at this time with a known uh, abscess would put you at high risk for a lot of other complications. 
Um, so in this patient with a perforation, uh, everybody kind of agrees that would be antibiotics and interventional radiology placement. It's those that present with non-perforation and mild symptoms where the controversy really assists, is um, prevalent for non-operative management. All right, final question for this section. A patient with an obturator hernia is most likely to present with A, dull pain in the lateral thigh, B, sharp pain in the peritoneum, C, pain on urination, D, hematuria, or E, bowel obstruction. So correct, bowel obstruction is the right answer. So obturator hernias are a pretty rare form of hernia. Uh, it's less than 0.1% of all hernias. Uh, and it's pretty difficult to diagnose based on its location. So it's a protrusion of intraabdominal contents through the obturator foramen of the pelvis. Uh, this is usually can occur from laxity of the pelvic floor related to advanced age, increased abdominal pressure, uh, several pregnancies, poor nutrition. But intestinal obstruction is the most common clinical finding uh, in over 80% of patients. Um, the uh, classically described uh, hauschip romberg sign is described as pain down the medial aspect of the thigh with abduction, extension, and internal rotation of the knee. This is present in less than 50% of the patients and can be easily confused with osteoarthritis pain in this population. Uh, repair should be attempted through an abdominal approach as this will allow you for access to the defect uh, and reduction of the contents may require incision of the obturator membrane in order to get it fully reduced. Uh, it should also be noted that mortality from this hernia has been quoted to be as high as 13 to 40 percent, likely due to the difficulty with diagnosis and usually the poor health of patients when they present. So, correct. Bowel obstruction is the most common one. Dr. Blatnick, uh, that is our last question in that section. I want to thank you very much for um, uh, ushering us through that portion of the webinar and also keeping the group occupied during our technical difficulties. <laughs> sure thing. Well, thanks again for having me, and uh, good luck to everybody on the app site. All right. All right. We're going to... Uh, uh, transition over to our uh, sorry we're going to transition over to our next uh, section which is um, uh, colorectal and this um, is going to be ushered by Dr. Uh, Amber Traugott. Uh Dr. Traugott is one of our um, a good friend and colleague from uh, Ohio State. Um, yeah, just to uh, get us back online here again as we got that uh, same glitch, unfortunately. apologize. Uh, Dr. Traugott is a um, former WashU grad and is now um, a colorectal surgeon at Ohio State University. Dr. Traugott, are you with us there? Yes, I am. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Again, apologize for the, uh, the delay here, but we'll get you up and running shortly. All right. Well, I, I will probably abbreviate um, the, the questions I'm going through so we can get to Dr. Alsady's section as well, but, um, right. but we'll do a couple more. Um, so uh, a 38-year-old female presents to the emergency department because of severe painless hematochesia and dizziness. What is the best initial approach? So A, proceed immediately to complete colonoscopy as the first test. B, proceed immediately to technetium-tagged RBC scan. C, send the patient for emergency angiography. D, perform an anoscopy and flexible sigmoidoscopy first to exclude distal colon lesions and place an NG tube to rule out an upper GI bleeding source. Or E, perform an abdominal series which might indicate ischemic colon. All right, great. So almost everybody got that one correct. Um, remember, the key is that you need to localize where the bleeding is coming from first. And the point in this question is that the patient is probably having some hypotension. So you want to do what um, can be done quickly without much prep time or sending the patient off for additional testing. So number three, a 60-year-old man with hypertension and coronary artery disease underwent an open AAA repair. In post-op day two, he has abdominal pain and diarrhea. He has a temperature of 38.4. His heart rate is 110. His blood pressure is 100 over 60. On exam, he has diffuse abdominal tenderness and distension. Flexible sigmoidoscopy is performed and demonstrates gray appearing mucosa. What is the next step in management? A is CT scan, B, IV fluids and antibiotics, 
C, colonoscopy to visualize the proximal colon, D, exploratory laparotomy with resection and colostomy, or E, exploratory laparotomy with resection and primary anastomosis. All right, survey says 61% of you got it correct. So this patient should have a Hartman's procedure. What's happened here is after a AAA repair, you, you know, often have occlusion of the inferior mesenteric artery. And if the patient has insufficient collateral supply to the sigmoid colon, they can develop ischemic colitis. And that um, can proceed to full-blown necrosis in a minority of patients. Um, and uh, Flexible sigmoidoscopy is the, the first test to evaluate for that. If it appears to be necrotic, then the patient needs to go emergently for a resection. Number four, a 51-year-old man is scheduled for a left colectomy for cancer just distal to the splenic flexure. Which of the following is most likely to reduce his risk of postoperative ileus? A, analgesia, analgesia via a patient-controlled system. B, administration of alvimapan. C, administration of metoclopramide, D, early postoperative feeding, or E, administration of neostigmine. B, administration of alvimapan. Um, uh, early postoperative feeding is what most of the rest of you uh, selected. And while there is um, some uh, kind of retrospective data or data that's borne out in um, meta-analyses, uh, usually as part of um, uh, early enhanced recovery protocols. Um, there's not much prospective randomized data on early postoperative feeding versus not. And so the quality of the data is not as good um, for early postoperative feeding as it is for alvimapan, which is, has randomized trial data. Um, but it is, that being said, early postoperative feeding is also something that that probably reduces the risk of postoperative ileus. It just is, has not been borne out in as good a quality of data. Um, we'll do one more question, and then I think we will um, uh, move things along since we had some extra time to answer some colorectal questions. Uh, a 24-year-old man has an uneventful appendectomy for acute non-perforated appendicitis. On the following day, the pathology report notes Acute inflammation with a 1.2 centimeter carcinoid of the mid appendix. This patient should have A, serial urinary 5 HIA levels, B, no further treatment, C, right hemicolectomy, D, chemotherapy, or E, regional radiation therapy. Okay. So most of you got it right. So no further treatment. So this it is a commonly tested um, knowledge point about um, uh, appropriate management for appendiceal carcinoid tumors. So remember, uh, appendectomy is fine if the tumor is under two centimeters and it's at the tip or mid appendix uh, as long as it's not at the base. Uh, because the risk of metastasis is, is very low from, uh, from lesions that are removed in that way. But um, lesions that are two centimeters or greater or at the base, you want to do a right hemicolectomy. Next question for my part is the 29-year-old female presents to your office with a history of recurrent perianal abscesses requiring multiple previous incision and drainages. She otherwise has no symptoms, no past medical history, and no relevant family history. The next best step in management of her condition is A, an MRI of her pelvis, B, a complete colonoscopy, C, an examination under anesthesia, D, a transvaginal ultrasound, or E, an endorectal ultrasound. 
Okay, good. Examination under anesthesia is correct. Uh, the reason that a complete colonoscopy is, is not correct is um, that this is a patient that doesn't have any abdominal symptoms or bowel symptoms to suggest that she may have inflammatory bowel disease as a contributing factor. So in this case, um, you really just want to do an exam under anesthesia to try to um, sort out if this patient has a fistula or not because that's the most likely cause for recurrent anal abscesses in a patient who's otherwise healthy and asymptomatic. Uh, MRI can be used uh, to evaluate for fistulas, but that's usually not the, the first test that's done. Usually you'll do an exam under anesthesia first and, and reserve MRI for patients who have complex fistulas or fistulas that have recurred after prior repair. Um, and then um, transvaginal and endorectal ultrasound are not routinely used. There are some, um, you know, very limited clinical circumstances in which you might do those things in the office, uh, but uh, it's not part of the usual algorithm. All right. So number seven, a 63-year-old man presents with recurrent C. diff colitis. He was successfully treated as an outpatient with a 10-day course of metronidazole six weeks ago. He returns today with similar symptoms as his first episode. The most appropriate management of this patient includes which of the following? A, repeat C. diff antigen assay to confirm diagnosis. B, consult gastroenterology to evaluate the patient for an urgent fecal microbiota transplant. C, metronidazole for 14 days. D, oral and rectal vancomycin for five days. Or E, cholestyramine alone. And the poll is open. All right, that's correct. So um, the current recommendations are for a patient who is um, clinically stable and um, appropriate for outpatient treatment if they fail their initial course of C. diff colitis. Um, you don't need to repeat testing if their symptoms are, are the same. Uh, and you repeat a, a similar or the same antibiotic for a longer course before you um, change antibiotics. All right, number eight. Endorectal ultrasound examination. A, predicts wall invasion more accurately than CT scan, but less accurately than MRI. B, easily distinguishes tumor from radiation-induced changes. C, accurately predicts pathologic results of chemoradiation. D, can accurately predict perirectal lymph node involvement. Or E, often understages the tumor. And this is for rectal cancer. All right, good. So most of you got this correct. It can accurately predict perirectal lymph node uh, involvement. It uh, um, has a, it's also good for evaluating wall invasion. invasion. It has a specificity of 90, greater than 90%, sensitivity of uh, over 95%. Uh, it's about comparable to MRI, but that is a little bit stage dependent. So the, the, Answer A isn't, isn't really um, completely accurate, and that's why. All right. Number nine, what's the typical standard medical therapy for severe to fulminant chronic UC? So A, prednisone, B, aminosalicylate, C, cyclosporin, D, infliximab, or E, methylprednisolone. Yes, so let's talk a little bit about medical therapy for inflammatory bowel disease um, because there was a question earlier where I think there was an error. So, so let's clarify a little bit of that. So if you have a patient come in acutely with severe to fulminant disease, um, they get uh, IV steroids as um, kind of their acute initial management at high doses. So that's the correct answer here, which is methylprednisolone or solumedrol. Um, usually, if they have improvement with that, they'll be transitioned to oral prednisone as their, um, as their symptoms improve. 
Um, but then some plan will need to be made for appropriate maintenance therapy, as, uh, as steroids are not appropriate maintenance therapy long-term for IBD. Um, infliximab is a very common uh, maintenance therapy. It was the, the first uh, anti-TNF medication. It's given as an infusion. There are other anti-TNF medications, and there are other types of biologics that um, have other biologic targets that are now used for Crohn's disease maintenance therapy. Um, that's correct. So that for this question, severe to fulminant UC, if someone comes in, um, I, are, you, are you talking about the word chronic? Is that what you mean? Okay, so so the uh, I think there that's just the phrasing that the patient has chronic UC and they've now come in with a severe to fulminant presentation. So uh, I, I think in this case you want to focus more on the word fulminant than on the word chronic when you're trying to interpret that question. Um, hopefully on the aerial app site it would be phrased a little bit more clearly. Does anyone else have any other points on that? before I go on to the next question. Okay, so number 10, uh, a 65-year-old man has colon cancer, metastatic to the liver, nine months after sigmoid colectomy for a T2N2 M0 colon cancer. The patient has no comorbid disease that would preclude safe surgical exploration. Which of the following on preoperative evaluation would be a relative contraindication to hepatic resection? A, recurrent disease in the left lower quadrant, B, two metastatic lesions requiring a formal right hepatic lobectomy or hepatectomy. C, perihepatic nodal disease. D, a CEA level of 15. E, poor predicted survival because of advanced primary stage. So Julia, um, I know it's not related to this particular question. So infliximab may be first line maintenance treatment. That decision is usually made based on the clinical presentation of the patient um, and made, usually made by a gastroenterologist. It may be a reasonable first-line maintenance treatment for a patient, but they may also select a different agent. They might um, select something like azathioprine um, as a first-line treatment rather than going to a biologic. So it, it is a, an appropriate choice. It, it's really going to depend on that patient. All right. So back to this question, yes, perihepatic nodal disease. So um, the principle that's important to keep in mind here is that um, we operate on liver metastases for colon cancer um, when we still think that it can potentially accomplish a cure for the patient. So if the patient has, um, has liver-related metastases that are unresectable or that um, indicate that um, disease has spread outside the liver, um, you can no longer really achieve a surgical cure. And so in this case, uh, perihepatic nodal disease indicates that that uh, has taken place in that patient. All right, question 11. Which of the following statements about colorectal carcinoma associated with Crohn's disease is true? A, the frequency of carcinoma in, is similar in patients with extensive long-standing unresected Crohn's colitis and those with extensive ulcerative colitis, B, it usually occurs in women, C, the right colon is involved in over 70% of patients, D, the occurrence of carcinoma is unrelated to the duration of Crohn's disease, or E, the mean age of patients with colorectal carcinoma is 35. All right, so A is correct. Um, so let's talk about that. So, if you look in your textbook, it's always going to tell you that the, the risk of cancer is higher for UC than it is for Crohn's patients. Um, however, the, once the patients have had long-standing disease that's been, um, that's been active in particular, um, those differences tend to even out in patients who've had the disease, you know, for 15 years, 20 years. Um, the, those risks actually are very similar between those two diseases. And so it's important to note that while that may be true when you're talking about patients who are kind of around 10 years out from their diagnosis, as you get out more towards um, 20 plus years, um, that frequency tends to be similar between those populations. Okay, for Jod, when do you do resection versus RF ablation? 
Most of the time, a liver surgeon is not going to choose RF ablation if something is resectable and the patient can tolerate it. RF ablation um, is not, uh, doesn't have as good of a prognosis in terms of affecting cure, so it may be used on a selected basis in patients who have underlying liver disease that precludes resection. All right, question 12. A 73-year-old patient with Parkinson's disease presents with abdominal pain, distension, and tachycardia. Physical exam is consistent with peritonitis. Plain abdominal series suggests sigmoid volvulus. The most appropriate next step in management is A, attempted endoscopic decompression, B, percutaneous thecostomy tube, C, operative exploration, D, ICU observation, or E, barium enema. Okay, good, operative exploration. So those of you that, that selected endoscopic decompression, in a stable patient without peritoneal signs, that is the answer. Um, in a patient with peritonitis, then the answer is to operate. Let's go to the next one. So 13, indications for acetone would include all of the following except, this is an except question. Um, a, a 34-year-old female with a complicated anal fistula encircling most of the sphincter mechanism. B, um, to prevent premature skin closure or recurrent abscesses in a 42-year-old male with a history of Crohn's who is status post-staged fistulotomy. C, a 56-year-old female with a history of AIDS and norm, known poor healing with fistula in ano. D, a 33-year-old female with an anterior fistula. Uh, or E, a 61-year-old male with an anal fistula uh, who has an extra sphincteric fistula with a second internal opening above the puborectalis. E is the correct answer. Uh, in general, in most situations, you're, you're safe to place a seat on if you're not sure what else to do. Uh, this situation in particular is, a, is an extra sphincteric fistula that where the second internal opening was likely caused by an iatrogenic injury by the surgeon um, at the time of an expiration. And so that, that's the diagram where you've got two fistula tracts that are connected. One is transphincteric, and the other one goes all the way up above the levators. And in that, in that case, um, the, the key is that you want to um, uh, those are very hard to get fixed, but you could lay open the internal sphincter at the site of the dentate line internal opening um, to relieve distal pressure, and you can actually close the, the uh, more proximal opening um, with some either, um, you know, slow-absorbing non-absorbable suture um, or uh, or I'm sorry, slow-absorbing absorbable suture would be uh, probably the best preference. That's a really complex question. I'm not sure that that one is going to really um, be common on the app site, but it kind of highlights that you want to go over all the different fistula anatomies and kind of review um, how you would want to, um, how, to, how you would potentially repair those. Why would you not want to do a CTON for that last option? Um, the issue is if you put a seton through the extra sphincteric fistula, you're going to make it very hard to heal it. Um, you, you could put a seton through the, uh, the more distal transphincteric branch of that. That might be a reasonable thing to do to try to get, uh, get it drained so that the proximal opening will close and then do something later for the distal opening. Uh, I think the point that they were trying to make there is that you really want to avoid instrumenting that iatrogenic injury any any more because you can you could potentially get it to heal as long as you get the transphincteric component adequately drained. Okay, 14 for patients with rectal carcinoma, preoperative external beam radiation, A interrupts RNA translation into protein components, B enhances five-year survival in Duke stage A patients compared with operation alone. C, allows sphincter sparing operation with no increase in local recurrence. D, results in uncontrolled nausea and vomiting in 25% of patients. Or E, is associated with significant diarrhea in 75% of patients after low rectal anastomosis. So the, the correct answer is C. So uh, 
basically performing um, neoadjuvant radiation therapy uh, allows us to take locally advanced tumors and reduce their local recurrence rate. And in patients that have um, very low tumors or very bulky tumors, uh, it can shrink them to the point where you take them from being not a candidate for a sphincter sparing operation and make them a candidate for a sphincter sparing operation without sacrificing their, um, their local recurrence rate. Uh, so that's, that's why, one of the reasons why we do it. Uh, enhances, it, yeah, it does not enhance survival. Ra it's a very important point. Um, radiation is to, is to control local recurrence rate. It is not, um, it is not uh, specifically to improve survival. All right, question 15. A 45-year-old male presents with rectal pain without any evidence of external erythema in duration or fluctuance. Digital rectal exam is notable for bulging of the anal canal that is painful to palpation. Appropriate management includes A, posterior midline incision for drainage of a horseshoe abscess, B, external drainage via incision in the ischioanal fossa, C, internal drainage with division of the internal sphincter along the length of fluctuance, D, external drainage via a catheter placement, E, internal drainage via an incision in the supralevator position. So let's talk about this. So what they are describing to you by, by explaining that you don't see any external erythema or induration um, and the, these findings in the anal canal is they're trying to make the point to you that this is an intersphincteric abscess and it has not entered the, the ischiorectal fossa at all. So um, for isolated intersphincteric abscesses, uh, we actually, uh, in most cases, what you're going to do is you're going to drain that by just basically performing a sphincterotomy over the abscess. And um, as long as you, it's an intersphincteric abscess and you're only dividing the internal sphincter, it should not have a major effect on the patient's continence. Um, the caveat there is that if you have a patient who already has a major disruption in their continence, then you may need to consider some you know, some alternative means of drainage, but, um, but in most cases that you're going to be tested on, that's going to be your answer. All right, question 16. Which of the following is most predictive of perforated appendicitis? A, younger age. B, white blood cell count greater than 10. C, tenderness at McBurney's point. D, female sex. Or E, more than three comorbid conditions. So this is just kind of a do you know do you know the answer question? <laughs> do, you, do you know the fact? Right. So more than three comorbid conditions is one factor that predicts that a patient comes in with, with a perforated appendicitis. Um, uh, other factors include male sex, older age, um, or lack of insurance. Um, some of those might seem somewhat intuitive as those might be reasons that a patient might delay presenting. Um, all right, question 17. A 52-year-old healthy man with abdominal pain undergoes a CT scan and is found to have sigmoid colon wall thickening. He is treated with oral antibiotics for seven days and his abdominal pain resolves. What is the most appropriate next step? A, sigmoid colectomy, B, repeat CT scan, C, colonoscopy in six weeks, D, total colectomy, or E, MRI. Colonoscopy in six weeks. It says it's the uncomplicated diverticulitis question. You all got it. All right, question 18. Goodsell's rule states, A, an intersphincteric fistula has an internal opening at the dentate line. B, anterior external openings have internal openings in the midline. C, intersphincteric abscesses should be drained through the rectum and not through the ischioanal fossa. D, internal posterior openings usually arise from complicated fistula tracts. E, external openings located anteriorly originate from the nearest crypt.
Okay, good cells rule gets tested a lot because it's it's easy to test. Um, so just remember that posterior fissile attracts. Yeah, picture, great. So posterior fissile attracts tend to um, originate from internal openings in the midline. Anterior um, tracts tend to go straight radially to um, to the anal canal. Keep in mind that in real life. Not every patient is going to follow Goodsall's rule, but uh, when you're tested on it, that's, that's what the rule says. All right, question 19. A 61-year-old patient with a history of chronic anterior midline fissure and baseline incontinence deflatus has failed treatment with diet modification, hydration, and topical calcium channel blockade. What would be the next, best next treatment option? A, oral calcium channel blockade. B, injection of Botox or botulinum toxin, C, topical nitric oxide donor, um, D, I, I assume that, yeah, the oral nitric oxide donor, okay, um, E, open lateral internal sphincterotomy. All right, so uh, botulinum toxin is actually the answer, and the key to that question is um, that, that they, they point out that the patient has baseline incontinence already to, to get. So uh, botulinum toxin is a reasonable treatment for anal fissure in patients that have failed um, topical therapies, whether that's calcium channel blockers or um, nitroglycerin. Uh, in a patient that's got incontinence, you know, that is um, kind of one of the more feared complications of lateral internal sphincterotomy. And so it's reasonable to give people a trial of Botox, which um, heals about 60 to 80 percent of fissures um, before you would consider doing something that might further compromise their continence. All right, last one. Which of the following colon polyps meets criteria for segmental colectomy? A, two centimeter tubular adenoma resected completely in a piecemeal fashion. B, one centimeter pedunculated tubular villus adenoma with a focus of carcinoma in situ limited to the polyp head resected completely. C, 1.5 centimeter sessile polyp with high grade dysplasia with a depressed ulcerated center. D, an 8 millimeter sessile polyp with carcinoma in situ completely excised with 2 millimeter margins, or E, a 1 centimeter sessile adenoma with high grade dysplasia resected completely. All right, good. So most of you got that correct. So the, the key is that, um, that in, in that polyp, the, the risk factor is that they have, it has a depressed ulcerated center. So uh, that uh, most likely uh, is, is a high risk polyp. Uh, there are other indications. Uh, if there's a cancer in a polyp, if it has lymphovascular invasion, it's poorly differentiated. If the margin is less than two millimeters, um, if it contains a malignancy and was taken out piecemeal, uh, then that, by definition, you're not going to be able to, to know the margin accurately. Um, if it's a pedunculated polyp uh, and it is uh, involving the, the lower stalk or the base, uh, or if it deeply invades the submucosa, like in the, the lower third, those are all reasons why a patient should undergo uh, a segmental colectomy after a resection of the polyp. Dr. Traga, thank you again very much. Uh, there was an outstanding question from Julia Coleman about uh, anal fistulomyalgia and Crohn's patients. Any quick um, tips on that? Sure. So um, the, you want to be very careful in a patient with Crohn's about being as aggressive about um, performing um, complex repairs or um, fistulotomies. Uh, that's particularly true if their Crohn's is not well controlled. So it's much safer in a patient where you suspect Crohn's or where you know they have poorly controlled Crohn's to, uh, to control their sepsis with a CETON until such time as their Crohn's is better controlled. Uh, usually that you're, you're, 
you're going to be safe for doing that and um, and optimizing their medical management before you perform any any sort of um, fistula specific surgery. Dr. Uh thank you very much, Dr. Alcidi. Are you there? Uh, I am. Okay, welcome, and thanks again for for doing this. Um, so the first. Uh, the case is a 68-year-old uh, man with abdominal pain, distension, nausea, vomiting, six days after a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. On physical exam, he is a febrile, mildly tachycardic, has moderate abdominal distension and tenderness without rebound. Laboratory values are white count of 11,000, bilirubin is 3.4, alkbos is 119, and the next step in the patient's um, uh, diagnosis and or treatment should be Number one, uh, A is biliary excretion tests, such as HIDA. B is exploratory lobotomy. C is ERCP. D is ultrasound. And E is percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram. Okay, excellent. So I think it seems like uh, at least half of people got it correctly in the sense that you really do need a, a, an imaging technique. Some people use ultrasound, some people use CT, but imaging is a good idea to figure out what's going on. Everything here has a place in the treatment of a bile duct injury. So ERCP is obviously very much indicated, especially in a Strasbourg type A, which is the majority of bile duct injuries. Uh, Explosive laparotomy, or at least laparoscopic diagnostic laparoscopy, is certainly in, uh, indicated in somebody with peritonitis for washout and placing in drains. And of course, a HIDA and a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram are, are, are uh, also part of algorithm depending on diagnosis and treatment of where the, the bile duct injury is. But in this setting, uh, the answer would be D, to start with an ultrasound to see if you have a bioloma or not. So we'll go to number two. And certainly, please feel free to put in some questions as we move along. We'll try to uh, certainly ask, uh, discuss questions that people are getting wrong. Number two is factors affecting oncologic outcome for hepatic resection for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma include all of the following except, obviously an except question here. So A, number of lesions, B, presence of tumor capsule, C, presence of cirrhosis, D, positive margin, and E is vascular invasion. As we're looking here, I'm seeing there's a question about infected necrosis for uh, pancreatic necrosis, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that as we're waiting for the next question, just to keep things on time. Thanks for asking that question. So a lot of people got, uh, so the answer here is presence of cirrhosis, which obviously are pe people are getting it wrong. And this is a, figured to be a difficult question. Dr. Awad and I were talking about this because you have to keep in mind here, we're talking about oncological outcomes. Doing liver, major liver resection is certainly has a higher uh, um, uh, um, perioperative morbidity uh, uh, in patients who have cirrhotics versus non cirrhotics but we're talking about oncologic outcomes. So if you look at oncologic outcomes in general, Number, if you have multifocal disease, it's always worse than unifocal. So one is certainly a bad thing. Uh, uh, two is presence of tumor capsule is a good thing, right? So um, uh, if you have uh, a, a, a tumor capsule versus an infiltrative type, so a tumor capsule is better. So it does affect it, so it is actually correct. C, cirrhosis is the correct a uh, answer because this is an accept question. So presence of cirrhosis does not make oncologic outcomes worse. They certainly have a, a long-term worse mort uh, mortality because the cirrhosis will increase the risk of recurrent HCC. But in terms of this HCC, it wouldn't make it worse. So the answer is presence of cirrhosis. Positive margins and vascular invasion is always a bad thing and does worsen your oncologic outcomes. So obviously those are correct and thus they are not the answer here since it's an accept question. So um, that's uh, so what's presence of cirrhosis. Let's go to number three. A 60-year-old woman has an, an open jejunostomy tube um, uh, placed 14 days ago using a Witzel tunnel technique. She is now complaining of colic abdominal pain 
tube feeds are flowing distally without a problem, and the patient is moving her bowels. Uh, but the abdominal films show dilated loops of proximal small bowel. What is the most likely technique? Uh, sorry, most likely diagnosis. A is postoperative ileus. B is small bowel obstruction due to volvulus of bowel at the jejunostomy site. C is an adhesive small bowel obstruction. D is small bowel obstruction due to incarcerated hernia. And E is partial small bowel obstruction due to narrowing of the lumen at the jejunostomy site. <clears throat> As we're doing this, the question with respect to infected pancreatic necro uh, necrosis, remember that if you have a diagnosis of an infection, then drainage and debridement is necessary. How you do that, laparoscopically versus open versus endoscopically, endoscopically depends on where you are, what resources you have, and where is the, the infected necrosis. In general, we tend to, to favor endoscopy, but certainly laparoscopy or open is still a technique that's accepted. So let's go back to our question here. And the answer is correct. It is, it is the last one, E. In general, when you ever do a, a Witzel technique, you're going to narrow the bowel. In somebody who's malnourished or small, the bowel is already small, and this tube uh, can even narrow it even further. Remember also that um, uh, volvulus at the exigenostomy site is a possibility. However, it's, we're asking for the most likely technique, and by far and away, uh, a, te a technical problem here is most likely. Next question. Question number four, and that is a 56-year-old female with obstructive jaundice fail, uh, uh, fails biliary decompression via USDP and is brought to the operating room for management. Intraoperative cholangiogram confirms presence of cholecolithiasis. The next most appropriate step is A, col uh, uh, colodotomy and common bile exploration. Uh, uh, B is transduodenal sphincterplasty. C is cholecystectomy and expectant management. D is cholecystectomy and referral for percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography. And E is transcystic common bile duct exploration. So about, so about half got it correctly. The answer is transcystic common bile duct exploration. That by far and away is the least morbid of all options. If that fails and you are experienced in doing uh, uh, cold dichotomy and common bile duct exploration, then that is your second option. Um, in general, that is not an option if you're not comfortable doing it or trained to do it. And, the next, uh, and, if, and if you do a transcystic and it does not work and you're uncomfortable doing a common bile duct exploration, the answer is really to, put a, to, to leave your cholangi uh, cholangiography catheter in the cystic duct as your drain uh, if, you, if, you, if you feel like the common bile duct is obstructed completely and refer to a place that can actually to a common bile duct exploration. But those are two, the two appropriate answers. But the most uh, immediate uh, appropriate step is transcystic, which is the least morbid. Next question. A 20-year-old woman with jaundice has a falsiform dilatation of her extrahepatic bile duct. Therapy for this condition is aimed at prevention of which of the following complications? A, carcinoma of the bile duct, B, cholodocolothiasis, C, cirrhosis, D, sclerosing cholangitis, E, duodenal obstruction. So there's a question about the, uh, that's on the, uh, uh, the board, whether, whether the cold dichotomy and common bile duct exploration would be most appropriate for distal. You still would start with a cystic, transcystic exploration. In general, if you can do it transcystically, it is the best thing for the patient. If you can't, then absolutely trans common bile duct exploration is reasonable. Going back to our question here. And most of you got it correctly, is that the point of doing a, a excision of the falsiform, a fusiform uh, uh, cholodocalcyst is to try to decrease the risk of cholangiocarcinoma. Remember that, um, uh, that uh, removing the, col the cholodocalcyst does not remove the risk of cancer altogether. These patients are high risk for cancer, including HBB wide. In other words, cholangiocarcinoma within the pancreas head within the liver itself, so they still need screening, but removing the fusiform will decrease the risk of cancer by removing the most common place. Okay? And that's, of 
figure of the different types of called local cysts. Okay, see, I see there's a question which I will answer in a second, but let's go on to read this one first. A 40-year-old woman presents the ER with new onset right upper quadrant abdominal pain of eight-hour duration. She reports no fever, nausea, or vomiting. On exam, she does not have a Murphy sign or right upper quadrant tenderness. Her white blood count is normal. Ultrasound demonstrates stones without gold bladder wall thickening or pericolistic fluid. After receiving pain medications, pain completely subsides. Appropriate management would be A, admission to the hospital, MPO, and then antibiotics and laparoscopic colostectomy. B, admission to the hospital, MPO status, antibiotic therapy, and eventual delayed colostectomy four to six weeks later. C, is prescribing of pain medications, discharge from the ER, and eventual elective laparoscopic colostectomy. And D is HIDA scan if negative, abdominal CT to, uh, to confirm or rule out cholecystitis. So um, back to our questions here. Is it true that cold local cyst repair is primary done to prevent recurrent cholecystitis? The, uh, that is not true. Uh, the patients will have um, higher risk of cold local lithiasis but not necessarily of recurrent cholangitis because the sphincter of OD is intact in most of these patients. Okay, going back to our question. So uh, the answer is, uh, most of you got it correct, and the answer is C, which is prescribing pain medications, discharge, and elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Rem remember that uh, A is not necessarily wrong, it's just that it's uh, an inappropriate use of resources, and most of these patients actually do better as an, as, as an outpatient. In general, outpatient surgery is always safer and less costly than as an urgent or inpatient setting. So, so remember that this is a spectrum. You have to learn how to differentiate between symptomatic cholelithiasis, which is what this patient has, versus acute cholecystitis. If this patient had any of those symptoms above, the, uh, or signs on ultrasound, you would be worried about acute cholecystitis. In that setting, the answer would be A, admitting to the hospital, MPO, and antibiotics, uh, and then laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Okay, we can go to the next one. The next one is 70-year-old man in the medical ICU has been, uh, has been treated for septic shock due to pneumonia and has been weaned off vasopressors 48 hours ago. Over that time, he has developed fever, severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain, Blood, sputum, and urine cultures are unremarkable. On abdominal ultrasound, you most likely expect to see A, a normal gallbladder without stones, B, the presence of gallstones without evidence of cholecystitis, C, the absence of gallstones with pericolistic fluid and the thickening of the gallbladder wall, D, is the presence of gallstones with uh, pericolistic fluid and uh, thickening of the, of the gold bladder wall, and E is uh, gastric outlet obstruction. Okay, so the answer here is correct. Uh, you, uh, it's C, and the, the absence of gallstones. Uh, remember that if this patient, if the same scenario was written without the right upper quadrant pain, uh, you would not uh, diagnose this patient with acalculus cholecystitis. Patients who are in septic shock often have a lot of these mimicking secondary signs of acute cholecystitis. In other words, they will have fluid around their gallbladder. They will have thickening of the gallbladder wall. And in those patients, if they don't have symptoms, you don't want to assume a cholecystitis, and a HIDA scan is the best study because the HIDA scan will either show patency or non-patency of the cystic duct, and a non-patent cystic duct is diagnostic. Of B is chemoradiation of, uh, to the gallbladder fossa and porta hepatis. C is gemcitabine plus cisplatin neoadjuvant chemotherapy following by definitive resection. D is hepatectomy segment 4B and 5, portal lymphadenectomy and port site resection. And E is hepatectomy segment 4B5, portal lymphadenectomy. Uh, going back to our questions, what if these patients are really sick and intubated and cannot be given uh, uh, cannot be given a reliable abdominal exam? If they are that sick, uh, Marianne, you would do a, tr a trans uh, an, a bedside ultrasound guided transhepatic uh, cholecystostomy tube. That is the best way to treat these patients. 
So the answer, back to our uh, question number eight, the answer is indeed E, which is hepatectomy segment 4B5 and portal lymphadenectomy. Let's take a second here. In general, port site resections are not thought of favorably anymore, and so you do not want to do port site resections unless there is an abnormality there, for example, a nodule or a positive HIDA. A new adjuvant chemotherapy has never been really studied in gallbladder cancer. Bile duct resection, which is the first uh, answer, is only indicated when the cancer is low in the gallbladder and invading into the bile duct. That will never be a T2. A T2 means that it's not through the serosa, and so it's actually very, it's very early. And so a T2 is early cancer, and in those patients, you do not need to do a bile duct resection. So the answer, again, is the last one, which is E. Okay, let's go on to the next one. You see, you're seeing a 59-year-old man in the ED who presents with five days, excuse me, five days of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and obstipation. You obtain a CT scan which shows dilatation of the, of the GI tract through the transverse colon. The distal colon is decompressed with no air visualized in the rectum. Labs indicate a white blood count cell of 7,000, potassium of 3, chloride of 90, and creatinine of 1.56. On exam, he is diffusely tender but shows no peritoneal signs. What is the most likely diagnosis? A, diverticulitis, B, ileus, C, adhesive bowel disease, D, malignant bowel obstruction, and E is sigmoid bulbulus. Uh, to the questions on the board here, Allison, there is really no value in port site resection unless you've shown that there is cancer there and the patient is actually, and the disease is, is of, of good uh, bio, biology, in other words, indolent and is not metastatic everywhere else. Okay, so back to our question number nine. Most of you got it correctly. The answer is D, malignant bowel obstruction. Remember, sigmoid valvulus, we're talking here about the transverse colon, and there isn't the pathognomonic um, uh, or the classic kind of uh, bean shape or uh, inverted U shape of uh, um, obstruction that you see in the sigmoid valvulus. Adhesive bowel disease can happen in the large colon. However, it is very uncommon in the setting of patients uh, in this kind of a scenario with no previous surgery, especially in the setting of a of an large bowel obstruction. Okay, number uh, 10, next question. Ampelectomy is least likely to be indicated in A, uh, a two centimeter villus uh, adenoma, B, two centimeter gastronoma, C, carcinoid less than three centimeters in diameter, D, adenocarcinoma of the ampulla less than three centimeters of the, in diameter, and last one is E, adenomatous polyp. So people got this wrong. So let's take a second here. Ampelectomy means removing the ampulla without doing a Whipple. Uh, this is not a cancer surgery, and so in that setting, adenocarcinoma of the ampulla would be incorrect to, to treat it with an ampelectomy. So the correct answer is D, which is ampelectomy for an adenocarcinoma. All the other ones are not an adenocarcinoma, and ampelectomy is acceptable. I would have to say, though, for question number C, which is carcinoid, that is, ampelectomy for that is becoming less uh, of a standard because there is a, a, a data to show that carcinoids of even two centimeters can still have positive lymph, uh, uh, lymph nodes, and so that's kind of falling out of favor. But in general, certainly ampelectomy for an adenocarcinoma is inappropriate. Okay, next question. A 56-year-old man presents to the, to the ED um, complaining of nausea and vomiting for the past three days. He denies a bowel movement or flatus during the time period and is unable to keep or, uh, oral nutrition. He reports a history of recurrent colon cancer with known tumors in the abdomen. CT imaging reveals an, a, a, an abdominal mass uh, involving the small bowel with dilated small bowel loops proximal to the tumor. Malignant bowel obstruction is the diagnosis, which uh, agent has been shown to significantly decrease the severity of the nausea and vomiting and patient's discomfort in, in patients with malignant bowel obstruction. A is octreotide, B is morphine, C is ondansetron, and C is scolopamine. Scol 
So, Kevin, the, the best answer used to be uh, for elective cholecystectomy after pancreatitis is immediately or in that same hospitalization. However, the guidelines have changed and within four weeks is acceptable. So let's take this a little bit here. Uh, this question is a little challenging. This is a malignant bowel obstruction. All of these, well, not all of them, octreotide and endostran and scolopamine are ones that we use for patients with nausea and vomiting. However, in a malignant bowel obstruction, uh, patients tend to have, it, it's a very challenging fix, and the, and the obstruction tends to be very tight and is not something that responds to NG decompression very well. So octreotide, which is the answer, that is A, has really uh, been shown to be benefit for these patients because it decreases secretions and helps them to have less nausea and, uh, and less vomiting because of that. So in general, octreotide for bowel obstruction is not typically used for normal bowel obstructions, but is very much used for malignant bowel obstruction, which is, this, which is what this is, and the answer is A. Okay, next question. So a 32-year-old female uh, patient is recovering from small bowel resection with an end ileostomy. Which of the following statements is correct regarding potential complication and their appropriate management? A is stenosis of stoma uh, is due to uh, postoperative ischemia, thus mild stenosis must be managed with surgical intervention. B, any patient with patchy necrosis of the stoma should be taken to the operating room er emergently. C, patients with prolapse of the stoma will, will receive the greatest long-term benefit with amputation of the prolapse stoma. D, fistula may, may form from inadvertent full thickness placement of sutures through both walls uh, during the, uh, the creation of the, uh, the stoma, and the treatment usually involves placement of, of the stoma at a new site. E, if the stoma is, has retracted and is uh, in a fixed position, the patient can be observed. And most people did not get it correctly. The answer is actually D. Fistula may form from inadvertent full thickness placement of sutures through both walls uh, during the creation of the stoma, and treatment usually involves uh, uh, placing the stoma to a new site. This is because uh, of the erosiveness of the uh, ileostomy um, uh, output. And if you have that kind of fistulization to the, to, to the skin, that's not going to go away by itself. So D is the answer. Let's go over some of the other ones. So the last one here, if the stoma is retracted and is in fixed position, the patient can be observed. That's not tr true either. If it's retracted, these patients, again, get horrendous alterations of their skin. And taking the stoma, uh, replacing the stoma is the right answer. Uh, the other ones you did not choose, but also a prolapse stoma should not be amputated because it just basically prolapses even more. Uh, and so usually reversal or to put it in a new place is the way to go. Okay, we'll go to the next question. 32-year-old biotech executive has low-grade fevers and intermittent low abdominal pain. A radiological workup shows a 10-centimeter narrowing in the distal ileum and cobblestone changes of the mucosa in, the, in that area. The most uh, appropriate maintenance therapy is A, ileocolic bypass, B, administration of, uh, of uh, Remicade, C, is ileocolic resection, D, is administration of prednisone, and E, is ileoresection. Julia, all of this is going to be uh, the, uh, the, the entire uh, webinar and audio will be on SAGE's uh, website, and you can watch the whole thing, including the commentary. Thanks for the feedback, uh, M&D. So OK, let's see how people did here. OK. So people, uh, obviously, the, answer, the correct answer is D, which is prednisone. The, many people answered Remicade, which has a role in treatment of Crohn's disease. However, in general, remember that um, uh, that is left for people who do not respond um, uh, um, to, to, uh, to, to prednisone as an initial therapy. So, so in general, that's not the, uh, the, the correct answer. So prednisone is the first answer. Remember that, that medical therapy is always primary in, in Crohn's disease surgery is really left for complications that are not treated, that cannot be treated medically, like perforation and bleeding and things like that. So the other ones would not be correct. Okay. 
Next question. 14. Which of the following statements regarding the water-soluble contrast medium challenge is, uh, um, sorry, in the workup of a patient with small bowel obstruction is false? Remember, it's a question about which ones are false. So A is the water-soluble challenge should be administered orally or by NG tube at the time of initial CT or after a short waiting period, one to two hours after NG tube placement to allow for adequate decompression. B an upright abdominal film should be obtained 48 to 72 hours after the water-soluble challenge to evaluate if the contrast is visible in the colon. C, if no water-soluble challenge is seen within the uh, colon on repeat abdominal films, uh, the patient is unlikely to resolve their small bowel obstruction with conservative management alone. D, is water-soluble challenge can predict resolution of small bowel obstruction with 96% sensitivity and 98% specificity. And the E is water-soluble challenge can be found, uh, can, uh, has been found, sorry, to be therapeutic in, in addition to diagnostic with accelerating resolution of small bowel obstruction after administration. Okay, let's see what questions we have here. So, Thomas, you're correct that it does say maintenance. Uh, re remember um, that that probably is a confusing part of that question. Um, in general, however, Remicade is not given over and over again for maintenance. But you're right. Um, after rereading that question, I think the word maintenance may have thrown people off. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so the, the correct answer, oh, a lot of people missed it. So B is the correct uh, answer, meaning B is false. So an upright abdominal film should not be obtained 48 hours to 72 hours. That is way too long for water-soluble con contrast. But if you wait that long, you're not going to see any contrast at all. So the answer, uh, so B is false in the sense that the timeline is 4 to 24 hours, 4 hours to 24 hours. Um, the rest are all correct, actually. Um, so um, uh, it's a good question to review because it tells you a lot about this test, which has become very standard. Um, but the correct answer, the, the, in, the, the B was false. Okay. What is the best initial method of trans uh, colodoscope? Uh, uh, sorry, tra trans colodoscopy uh, duct clearance. Sorry, I'm having a, a tongue twister here. Uh, a stone retrieval basket. Uh, B is lithotripsy and retrieval of stone fragments. C is flushing of stone with saline under direct vision after administrating a one milligram of glucagon intravenously. And D is colodocotomy and direct visualization of stones. Uh, sorry, direct re re retrieval of stones. C is the correct answer. Remember that uh, for those who answered A, uh, A is a good answer. Uh, however, it is not the best initial step initial step. Always an initial step do that what's, what's least invasive. It may not work often, but obviously it doesn't cost anything to do it and it's not dangerous. And so the first step is to flush and often that will take care of most stones that are less than five millimeters and uh, that uh, can preclude you needing to do any baskets or anything like that. Okay, next question. <coughs> 16. I'm going to get depressed if people miss this one. Uh, good question. 67-year-old man with a metastatic colorectal develops a, uh, develops a single liver metastasis. He undergoes laparoscopic resection of a lateral inferior aspect of the left lobe. The circulating nurse requests that you specify a, a label for the spec. Oh, thank God. Most of you got it. That's good. So segment three, remember it's left lateral section of the liver. We have a picture coming up. Uh, which uh, is, do we have the picture next? Maybe uh, which is very straightforward. You see, so it's left uh, lobe, inferior lateral. So that's segment three. Four A is way up by the diaphragm. In fact, four A is where you dissect to find the vena cava. So I'm not sure why people said four A. Uh, so it's segment three. Okay. All right, 17. Uh, a 35-year-old uh, female presents with acute onset of left-sided abdominal pain after two days uh, jogging, uh, jogging for two hours. She's hemodynamically stable. Sorry. 
she undergoes a CT scan of the abdomen with intravenous contrast and reveals moderate amount of hemoperitoneum and splenic uh, artery aneurysm that has ruptured. After initial stabilization, she undergoes angi angiographic coiling uh, embolization of the aneurysm. Which of the following uh, is true regarding splenic artery aneurysms? A, they affect men and women equally. Uh, B, they are often associated with high mortality in non-pregnant women. C, the treatment should be offered for all aneurysms greater than three centimeters in diameter or aneurysms in pregnant women. D, splenic artery aneurysms account for approximately 20% of all splenic aneurysms. E is none of the above. And the answer is, most of you got it correctly, it is C. Treatment should, uh, should be offered to all aneurysms greater than three centimeters and in pregnant women. Remember that uh, uh, D is incorrect because it's actually 60% of all splenic, uh, splenic aneurysms are in, this, in the splenic artery. Um, and then uh, with respect to B, uh, they are often associated with high mortality in, in non-pregnant women, which is incorrect because in pregnancy, it's actually even a 90% uh, um, uh, mortality and so certainly a big deal in pregnancy and that's why we try to avoid it and of course they are way more common in women than in men four to one so A is incorrect okay 18 what is the most common form of, uh, of intraoperative iatrogenic injury uh, in the dissection of the uh, bed during laparoscopic colostectomy A mistaking the combile duct uh, for a cystic duct B is mistaking a replaced right hepatic artery for a cystic artery. C, mistaking a right hepatic duct uh, that arises from the cystic duct as, uh, as the true cystic duct. D is thermal injury to the duodenum during the dissection. And E is inverted injury to the liver during uh, ductal dissection. So, Mohammed, it's a very complex question you're asking with respect to albumin. In general, we do not recommend albumin. Um, and Jarvis, I thought that the tumor was two centimeters. Did that change, or am I making that up? Um, two centimeters. I'm not really sure what you're talking about. I apologize. And embolization of splenic artery is a treatment or splenectomy. Uh, uh, if the embolization is certainly acceptable for, uh, for splenic artery embolizations, as long as you embolize distal and proximal to the aneurysm, so it's certainly acceptable. Oh, Jarvis, I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, for non-pregnant uh, patients, uh, uh, two, uh, three centimeters is when you uh, treat them. Uh, for Pregnancy or for patients who want to be pregnant, two centimeters is acceptable, especially now that they can be treated non-operatively, which is certainly much less invasive. Okay, going back to 18. Okay, uh, a lot of people got this incorrectly. The answer uh, is uh, A, which is mistaking the combined duct for the cystic duct. Let's see why people got this wrong. Uh, inadvertent injury to the liver duct during ductal dissection. So. Uh, I guess people are thinking maybe just um, uh, uh, bovine the liver bed or something, but we don't really consider that a bile duct injury, and that's maybe a little bit misleading here. Um, and, and also, ductal dissection means the cystic. Uh, the only duct you should be dissecting during a lab coli is the cystic duct. There's no indication to di dissect the calm bile duct, and so uh, really injuring the, the the liver bed during cystic duct dissection is really uncommon and shouldn't be done. But even if the liver bed is bovied, that's not really a bile duct injury, and that's why uh, E is not considered the answer. By far and away, calm bile duct injuries uh, are usually uh, a misrepresentation or a mis uh, observation of the common bile duct, thinking that it is the cystic duct, and so A is the answer. Certainly, the duodenum can be injured and so on. All of those are, are, can happen, but they're not common. Okay, 19. A 28-year-old male with uh, uh, probably synophilic esophagitis is undergoing upper endoscopy for a suspected food impaction. Which of the following is the least likely site? In other words, sorry, least likely site of obstruction in the esophagus? A, a aortic arch. Um, uh, B, lower esophageal sphincter. C, within a sliding hiatal hernia and D is mid-esophagus. Okay, all right, people got this incorrectly. And so the answer is actually C, um, uh, uh, which is within the sliding hernia. Remember that by definition, a sliding hernia, type 1 sliding hernia, is, is low pressure. 
So it is less likely that anything is going to be obstructed there. We're not talking about a paraesophageal hernia. We're talking about a sliding hernia. And so, it is, so the answer is C. The aortic arch is a place where food can get, uh, where, where there is a, uh, the, there can be a narrowing of the, or at least a tethering of the esophagus, so things can get stuck there. Same as the lower esophageal sphincter. The mid-esophagus is also a place where it's known that uh, things can get stuck, especially in, in pediatrics, and so that is also a known place where things can get stuck. So the answer is C. Okay, and last one. Uh, which of the following patients should not undergo uh, general endotracheal anesthesia for upper endoscopy. A patient with schizophrenia uh, who has reportedly ingested a fork. Uh, B, a patient uh, with large parasophageal hernia who reflexes contrast retrograde into the esophagus on barium esophagogram. C, a patient with active variceal bleeding. D, a patient with multiple large gastric polyps scheduled for removal. Remember, it's, uh, it's not, it's asking should not undergo anesthesia, general anesthesia. Okay, so people got this incorrectly. So the, the answer is the last one, which is a patient with, uh, with multiple large gastric polyps scheduled for removal. So let's go over each one. The first one, obviously an ingested fork is going to be incredibly challenging, and also a schizophrenic patient will also not be as cooperative. So two very good reasons to intubate the patient. The second one, uh, with the with the uh, uh, the parasophageal hernia, not only do you have a reflux issue here, which is high risk for aspiration, but also you have a parasophageal hernia, which make which kind of which may make it much harder to get through. And so again, here you have insufflation within the esophagus, which increases the risk of aspiration. Active variceal bleed are all, are notoriously high for aspiration risk, and so and also for hem hemodynamic instability. So they certainly should be intubated. The last one, what makes people feel that this is the right answer, uh, sorry, that this patient should be intubated, is the, is the thought that they need to be, that you have to go in, remove a polyp, come out, and then go back in, and out, and out, and in. But that actually can be done very easily with an overtube, where you put an overtube into the esophagus, and then you really just go through the tube, and you're not int uh, uh, intubating the upper esophageal sphincter multiple times. So the answer is D, which is a patient with multiple large gastric polyps can certainly be done uh, without general anesthesia. The rest have strong indications for intubation. Dr. El Sadie, thank you uh, once again very much for that uh, excellent My review pleasure. of uh, biliary influx endo. I want to thank your, you and all of our other uh, faculty speakers for another uh, wonderful webinar. It's um, been a long evening, and I appreciate all the attendees that stuck with us uh, through to the end. Um, a couple of final comments before we part. First of all, I um, want to thank again our sponsor, Thumbroll, for um, sponsoring the webinar today. It takes a lot to put this on, and it really is a, a great help. Uh, I've seen over 100 of you have uh, actually, it looks like, downloaded it uh, already, and I think you have hopefully discovered what a great resource it is. For those of you that have not, uh, please go ahead, and uh, uh, I think you won't regret having this uh, amazing surgical tool in your uh, smartphone at the ready. Um, also want to uh, uh, thank the organizers of SAGES, and again, please help us out by completing the link to the uh, survey. Um, the, that will be present on your uh, webinar screen here momentarily, and we would love for you to provide us some feedback. Uh, finding, uh, final parting words is uh, thank you again, and I wish everybody uh, great luck on the uh, app site and uh, the rest of your surgical careers. Uh, best of luck, and hope you can uh, see you at Sages. Thanks, and take care. Good night.